Unfortunately, there's no nice way to put this, so I'm just gonna put this. Leasing, it's the most expensive way you can acquire a vehicle, full stop. So what we're gonna do today is go through some real world numbers that prove that very fact. Then we're gonna go through some of your arguments. Then we're gonna go through some of my arguments. And at the end of this little exercise, you're going to realize that you're wrong and I'm right. So here's the script. I may be guilty of featuring nothing but cool and rather impractical cars here on the old show, as evidenced by virtually everything that is surrounding me at this very moment, with the exception of that car there. So to be fair to this exercise in leasing, we need to use an example that's practical. Something that people who are not excited about cars would wanna drive on a daily basis, something that's reliable, and I would argue something that you'd wanna put your kids in. I really can't think of a better example than a Honda Pilot. It's about as exciting as a root canal, but it's definitely something non-car people would drive around any major city in the US. Now that we've chosen the subject to focus on in this exercise, just like any other financial modeling, there are assumptions, I'll put the more pedantic ones here on the screen, but there are two we have to discuss right at the top. First and foremost, when you lease a vehicle, you're not leasing a car, you're not buying time in a car. What you're doing is you're buying into a lifestyle of convenience, one where you go into a car dealership, you pick out any car you want, and you get it for three, maybe four years, you have a warranty on it for most of that time, and at the end of that period, you go back to the car dealership, you turn it in, you tear another one off the roll, and this way, you don't have to deal with some crazy guy turning up at your house off of Craigslist. So I can see why leasing is incredibly alluring for most people, which is why most people don't lease a car once, maybe twice. They lease it over a long, or many cars, over a long period of time. So we're gonna do this comparison over the long haul. So we're gonna compare leasing a car over a 20 year period and buying a car over a 20 year period. Doesn't mean one car in each case. So we're gonna go through a three year lease, that means six different cars, or buying a car every five years. And the reason why I've chosen every five years is because most people that are gonna buy a Honda, they're gonna to wanna to have the majority of the time with the car to be covered by the warranty. And then there's that harsh reality, your partner in life. No, not your wife, not your husband, and definitely not your dog, rather the government. They're always gonna take their cut, whether it's leasing or buying a vehicle. In the US, there are two distinct ways in which they tax vehicles. In leasing, you are going to pay the sales tax on all of the payments of the vehicle. In buying a car, you're gonna pay the sales tax on the purchase price of the vehicle. However, in 42 different states, you are only gonna pay the sales tax on the difference between your trade-in and the purchase price of a vehicle. However, there are eight states in the land, sadly, one of them I'm standing in right now, that charge you the full sales tax on the full purchase price of the vehicle, even if you are trading in a vehicle. This will have an impact on our financial exercise. Okay, now that we're all on the same page, I picked a very real world example. I searched for local Honda dealerships here in Los Angeles, California, found one not too far from here that had one hell of a lease special on a car that many people would find interesting to drive. Not the basic pilot, the kind of middle of the road pilot, the EX has a sunroof, kind of a nice car. This one can be had for $400 a month plus the tax, not too bad. So let's say for the sake of discussion, we run that out for the 20 years. What would that cost us? $98,194 to rent a Honda for 20 years. Now what if we bought that same vehicle over the 20 years, replacing it every five years? That would cost us $85,937. So it'd be saving $12,257, or really 14%. Now, not a bad deal, you get a little bit of a savings, but not a huge difference. Let's say for the sake of discussion that I did this in one of these eight states, which sadly is, I think, Maryland, Virginia, Michigan, uh, California, Kentucky, I think they're missing some others. But again, 
Leasing, it's $98,194. But to buy the vehicle in those states, remember you don't get the tax benefit, $91,925, which would give us a $6,269 advantage to leasing. In other words, you'd be saving 7% over the 20 years. Again, not bad, but not really compelling. But then all of these arguments I'm giving you here are based on you paying cash. What if you financed the entire car for the entire period of the 20 years? So all you're doing is you're financing the first part, the whole car, and then the difference in the subsequent cycles. That would be $96,824. And in that case, you'd only be saving $1,370 or 1%. Sounds like the convenience of leasing would pay off in that case. But if I did it over the eight states like California, actually you'd be ahead in leasing because it would cost you $3,600 more to buy the car. And this is where we run into the first gotcha of leasing. You see, it is entirely possible that you could lease a series of vehicles over a 20 year period and save yourself $3,600 or 4% over the comparable buy of the exact same vehicle. But here's the problem with that. You would need to live in a place called Fantasyland. And here's why. Those figures don't take into account any damage over a 20 year period, like that's gonna happen, and they don't take into account the meter running after 12,000 miles. Because yes, you're gonna be charged between 12 and 20 cents a mile when you go over 12,000 miles. But that's not the biggest gotcha. The biggest gotcha is something called a subvented lease. So what is a subvented lease, you ask? Well, that's one of those fancy inside the industry terms that simply means discount. And what Honda is doing in this case, and pretty much every other manufacturer does it with the exception of Morgan, is they're giving the dealer money to lower the price of the vehicle, which in turn lowers the cap cost of the vehicle. That's the selling price of the car to you when you lease it or they buy down the rate at the bank, which in turn lowers the interest on the lease. Yes, there is an interest rate on a lease, you just don't see it. And that's what gives you a $400 car payment on a $35,000 vehicle. Now here's where we run into a couple of more problems. Number one, what's the likelihood of you finding a subvented lease on the car that either fits your needs or the car you wanna drive six times in a row over a 20 year period? And then what's the likelihood of you finding a bank or a car manufacturer that wants to give you a discounted lease in an economic downturn? Think about back in 2009, I don't care if you could have bought God's country on credit, you were not getting a lease on anything. Maybe you could finance it, but you definitely weren't leasing a car. But sadly, none of that matters against the fact that you don't want to drive the EX two-wheel drive pilot. Everyone wants to drive the fancy touring elite with the TV in the back, the leather seats, and most importantly, all-wheel drive. And guess what? That's the one that they sell, and that's the one they don't need to discount or subvent. So in a world where the average price of a new car is 35 grand and the average payment is just over $500 a month, this one is 50 grand and the payment is $771 a month. So let's go back to our 20 year example and you're gonna pay over a 20 year period $189,269. If you were to buy that same vehicle, $124,242. Put another way, $65,000 more to rent a fancy Honda or 52%. Ouch, that really hurts, doesn't it? And then let's say for the sake of discussion, we do this in California, one of these terrible eight states, still 100, almost 190 grand to lease it, but to buy it, $127,863, uh, $61,000 more to lease it, or 48%. And let's say for the sake of discussion, you actually finance it the entire time. Still $189,269 for the lease, but $147,000 in that worst case scenario in California, you're still 42 grand or 29% ahead in the buy.
Admittedly, some of those numbers really do sting for those of you that love leasing, but what's the old saying? Money, it ain't everything. So let's go through some of your arguments. One of my all-time favorites is my buddy who's really good with money. He says I shouldn't put all that money into a depreciating asset like a car. What I should do is lease the car, put the money in the bank, and I'll make a million dollars in interest. Well, you see, there's a problem with that. Uh, let's say for the sake of discussion, we look back past 20 years, the S&P 500 did about 8% on average. That's on average, not every single year. So when you lease the car, you have to beat what you're paying in interest every single month and not the three or 4% in this scenario. You have to beat it enough to pay the government taxes on your gains, still have a profit, pay the leasing interest and still have enough money to put up with all the risk of leasing a car. And then there's the very closely related, you should only be paying for the amount of the car that you actually use. You most likely heard this from your buddy down the street that's always leasing the BMWs. You know, the guy, he just got the brand new iPhone 11 Pro X, whatever they're calling it, for 75 bucks a month. You see, the problem with listening to him is he's broke. In Texas, they call it big hat, no cattle. And the reality is the people who are actually taking the money they're saving on car payments and putting it in the bank, that's the outliers, outliers, outlier. And here is where we move on to an argument that even I could almost empathize with. The motor man, I get a new car every three years. There's a warranty. The wife, she stopped yelling at me. Now I can certainly appreciate the value of that argument. However, what was the cost of that piece? I can certainly tell you in the first cycle alone, it was $14,400 plus taxes. As an alternative, may I present Exhibit A, a 2001 Honda Accord that we attempt to kill multiple times a year. You see, when people come visit us from either Europe or New York, and you know New York drivers, we loan them this car hoping it will not come back. However, invariably it comes back unscathed, right as rain. But let's say for the sake of discussion, someone does do something to it, like the transmission dies. Every single year that would cost us what? A thousand, maybe $1,400 in occurrence? Now compare that to that fancy black edition all-wheel drive pallet that your wife is really driving. Just the delta alone between the buy and the lease is somewhere between $42,000 and $65,000 that you throw into a trash can, light a match, and drop it in. And then we move on to my absolute favorite, which starts with, but Moto Man, my accountant says, I can write it off on my taxes. Yeah, there's a couple problems with that one. Uh, number one, have you seen the tax code as of late? Do you realize how much money you gotta be making to even get to the point of itemizing your deductions so you can write off the car. And then there's that pesky old concept of the 50 cent dollar. Have you ever heard of this one? Where you actually spend a dollar so you can get a 50 cent discount on your tax liability. So what you're doing is you're giving away a dollar to get 50 cents back from the government or really a discount from the government. But here's the real problem with that. Most folks that are leasing cars will still spend the dollar, but they're not making enough to get the 50 cent discount. They're probably only getting a 25 cent discount, or most likely less. And while we're on the subject of that fancy account of yours, there was one other fun fact I wanted to share with you, and what was it? Oh yes, to write off a car on your taxes, there's no law saying you have to lease it you can write off a car whether you lease it or buy it. Both are complicated and will most likely require a professional, but you can do it either way. And let's not forget, even if you're leasing it, a car is the second biggest expense in any given household. So what happens when life happens? For example, you gotta take care of an aging parent, a sick kid, you lose your job, or good news, you get a great new job, but it's across the country or around the world. What most people don't take into account, not just with car leasing, but all sorts of debt, is the risk involved and the huge negative impact on your future options in life.
Now, I am entirely confident that more than a couple of you will come up with a raft of arguments in favor of leasing, and you are absolutely welcome to leave them in the comments below or via our social media. However, it is high time for us to press on to the biggest reason why leasing is the most expensive way to acquire a vehicle, and that is giving away your future wealth. So I threw a lot of numbers at you today. One of them was that the S&P 500 returned on average 8% over the past 20 years. So let's say for the sake of discussion, we take that same $400 a month where we're gonna put into that subvented lease special EX two wheel drive Honda Pilot and we invested it into a simple S&P 500 fund over 20 years, we would have $235,608. But you say you don't like risk, you want something a bit more conservative. So let's say we get 5% on our money, that would be $164,413. Certainly a lot better than paying out 90 grand to rent a Honda for 20 years. But your wife ain't driving the basic Honda, or your entire family is not getting excited about the basic Honda. They want the one with the TV in the back and the leather, that black edition all wheel drive. Remember that was 771 a month. What would that turn into? Well, this is where we have to belt in because it gets really painful. At the 8% S&P 500 fund, $454,135. And on the conservative side of 5%, $316,907. Okay, I get it. Certainly a lot to digest, but there's one more thing I wanna share with you, perhaps a bit personal, but I feel strongly it will drive the point home. You guys know that I shoot this show at a general aviation airport here in Southern California, so it would stand to reason that I hang out with a lot of folks that have airplanes as well as cool cars. And contrary to popular opinion, these aren't CEOs and rock stars. These are electricians, plumbers. In fact, the guy that has the coolest car collection and not one but two Warbirds, he's a roofer. And he has a blower Bentley, a 1915 Stutz, one of 15 in existence, as well as many other cars. How did he do it? By not giving away his biggest wealth building tool. He didn't rent a Honda for 20 years. Instead, he drove a beat up old car and he got to the point where he was investing his money, maybe not in the S&P 500 funds, he invested it in real estate around Los Angeles and now he can drive anything he wants. A bit closer to home to this example, Remember the $454,000 we talked about that you could have made with that $771 a month? You could have that Lola, a real race car. Until I see you next time, bis später.